We're on the battlefield for Jesus. Come and join us in the fight. We're marching against Satan, and we're standing for what's right. We won't desert nor surrender. We are soldiers till we die. We're on the battlefield for Jesus. Victory is our battle cry. We're on the battlefield for Jesus. Come and join our happy throng. We're blood-washed, born-again believers, and we sing a joyful song. King Jesus is our mighty captain, and it's him we shall obey. We're on the battlefield for Jesus, winning souls for Christ today. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. We're on the battlefield for Jesus. Come and join us in the fight. Though the enemy be all around us, we shall not be put to flight. By faith we know we have the victory, and no matter what the cost, we will fight to rescue hopeless sinners. Not a soul must ever be lost. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior. Sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the 
reviving and passing out tracts, reviving and inviting people out to hear the Word of God, showing real concern for their soul, uh, taking the time to not just give them a tract, but to write down their name and their phone number, a written contact, and then following up, going back, and seeing those people door to door, soul winning, uh, discipleship. Something's wrong if we don't have time and make time to disciple new believers. We still have boxes of John and Romans that need to get into the hands of unsaved people. The gospel message is a very strong theme of those John and Romans. It's a marked edition. The plan of salvation is on the back. The Bible tells us that we are ordained as a church, as individual Christians, ordained to bring forth much fruit, that our fruit should remain. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. The Bible says, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Revival in soul winning. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I ask for your leadership and your guidance and unction and words that you would lead to be said. I pray that you'd help me, Father, submit myself as your instrument. I pray for the listeners, God, that you would stir our hearts, that you would do something real in this place tonight in the hearts of believers. Oh, Lord, not an emotional decision, not an emotional feeling, but that you would really deal with us, that you'll really Show us our need as a church. And Lord, I just pray that you would get the glory, that you'd get the honor, that our meeting tonight would not be in vain. Oh Lord, would you come now and honor thy word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Simply put, the people who attend many churches are not people that are new. The people that are attending many churches are people that have been there for years and years and years. Independent Baptist churches are trading members. Bible-believing churches are trading members. But what about the unreached? When I say trading members, I mean somebody will get mad at a pastor or not like a church, or maybe that church will apostatize, and they'll go to another Bible-believing church. And, and new members are received not through baptism, but by letter. Not by baptism, people that are new converts, but new members are received because they moved to another town. What's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is that we need to be winning the lost. We need to be reaching people in a location, and people won't come to a church, a Bible-believing church, just because it's in a location, unless they are aggressively sought out and asked to come and hear the word. Did you hear what I just said? They're not going to come because we have a sign up, okay? They're gonna come on June 4th. They're gonna come any service when the word is preached because they are aggressively sought out. That is what we're missing. We're too stuck in our own affairs to really get down to the business. Most of the time, these people are not contacted at church. They're contacted somewhere else first and they're befriended and they're loved. 
and they're cared about, and then they come to a service. Did you hear that? And so a relationship must be built before that person many times will even think about coming to church. We have a whole generation of people where the seed of the gospel hasn't even touched their lives, and many of them are living right underneath our noses, right next door to us. And the seed of the gospel hasn't reached them. I've got a burden on my heart this evening. I believe that God's ordained every believer in this room to reach people. I believe that God's ordained Cornerstone Baptist Church to reach people, lost people. And it's very under, important that we understand how to do this and that we do it and that we do it joyfully with the love of Christ in our hearts. That we do it with some holy enthusiasm, doing the work of God with enthusiasm today. Why do some churches grow and others do not? There's many reasons, but one reason is a lack of soul winning, a lack of zeal, a lack of brokenness over the estate of the lost. And if we're not careful, Cornerstone Baptist Church, we'll start to chart a different course and God won't bless it. And everything that he's done in the last 15 years can be destroyed in a single day. I believe that with all my heart. It can be destroyed if we just coast. It can be destroyed if we don't go forward as a church. To reach lost souls we have to stay on course on February the 14th 1945 that was the date of a massive bombing raid in Germany over an area called Dresden and it was launched by the Allied forces it was toward the end of World War one and that particular area of Germany was still given the the Allies' problems, even though they had wiped out almost everything else. And when those bombers flew over Dresden, our Allies, they, they dropped the bombs. And the bombs did their deadly work. And as the planes made their turn to come back, anti-aircraft fire almost knocked them out of the air. I can't think of anything more scary than flying a, a, an airplane and being shot at. It was pounding them to the point that if they didn't do something differently real fast, they were going to crash. They got the planes under control, but they had to drop out of formation. They didn't have cover. And the navigator said, look, I can get us back. I can get us back. We've destroyed a lot of things, but I believe we can get back without being shot at. So they fanned the engines down so they wouldn't be as noisy. And they got low to the ground and they started flying back over the area that was uncontested by now. And somewhere over the Belgium-Dutch border, the anti-aircraft fire broke out again on those airplanes. And this time there was no hope. They had to bail out. And they ended up bailing out in enemy territory. And they only survived because some British soldiers helped them. Nevertheless, they were shot down. One pilot, 47 years later, said this. I haven't told anybody about this, but it was my fault. I plotted the wrong course. One of the finest planes that America had ever built at that point in terms of endurance. Those planes had the finest machinery available in the 1940s. This same crew that flew out of formation and had to bail had been previously shot down and they all survived. So we're talking about professionals, men who were committed to their own survival. We're talking about people who were in sight of victory. People who knew that the war was almost over and that they were going to win it. People who had given their lives for this war. But when the wrong course was set, 
Even though it wasn't intentional, the result was that they had to bail out. Listen to me. Let me tell you where independent Baptists are today. Let me tell you where churches that say they're Bible-believing are today. They're flying in the sky, but they've charted the wrong course. And we've set a wrong course in many of our Bible-believing churches where there's good intentions. People want to praise the Lord and serve the Lord in our independent Baptist churches. We have the best machinery. We have proven and tried Sunday school methods. God gives us buildings. We step out in faith to take a loan. God pays our buildings off. But what we lack is zeal. What we lack is real concern. What we lack is a burden, separation from the world, and, and honesty about where we are spiritually. And even though we have all of the puppetry, we have no power. As a church, we won't get the job done if we get off course. And so how do we get zeal, power, burden, honesty? Number one, we need to understand our purpose. I want every member of Cornerstone Baptist Church to understand our purpose. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. In Acts 1.8, we see the same great commission that was repeated in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And in context, the disciples are asking questions of the Lord Jesus Christ. They want to know when is the earthly kingdom going to be established? When is stuff going to get rolling as far as the prophetic calendar? And Jesus says, you're going to get power and you will be my witnesses. And you'll witness for me everywhere. Here, there, everywhere. The Great Commission. And then as the Bible teaches us, Jesus goes back to be with the Father, seated on the right hand of God. So one more time, if you know who the writer of Acts is, that is Luke. Luke, one more time, after his gospel, gives us the Great Commission again in this New Testament book of Acts. And the first principle that needs to be laid down for a church is to understand its purpose, its purpose. Now, as I observe churches, I see that many of them have the wrong purpose. Say, so how can you judge that they have the wrong purpose? I can judge it by looking at the book of Acts, by looking at the New Testament. I find different things that determine the purposes of churches. And some of these things are not right. Some of them are effective at drawing people, but they're not the New Testament purpose for the church. And so what should determine our purpose? What should determine our priority? I'll tell you what should determine that. Nothing else but the word of God. We should do what the Lord told us to do when he left. And when he left, he said, be a witness. Every member of our church should be a witness. And if you're not witnessing, you're backslidden, you see? A witness. We should be about the business of seeking out people that are lost. Sharing the gospel with them. Seeding this wicked city and every generation we can with the gospel. And doing everything we can to see the gospel harvested in the hearts of the people that we come in contact with. The New Testament church understood its purpose. Do we understand our purpose? Does Cornerstone Baptist Church tonight understand its purpose? In churches today, other things drive people instead of God's purposes. In some churches, it's tradition. Boy, they get into a habit and a rut of doing the same thing in the same way. Tradiment limits many churches. Nothing's wrong with tradition unless it outlives its 
usefulness. Nothing wrong with tradition unless it keeps you from catching a hold of your pastor's vision of reaching lost people with the gospel. And I am amazed how churches do something simply because that's the way they've always done it. Never afraid to break out of the mold. Never afraid to try something new. Never afraid to launch out into the deep. Never afraid. I remember years ago when we were running one bus route and I said, I think we'll split it up. Oh, we can't do that. It'll never work. God blessed it. And then when we said, we're going to bring everybody here for Sunday school. Everybody not come in for the morning service. Oh, it'll never work. God blessed it. And the kids that came got more Bible. Now, now listen to me. Don't let tradition stop you from doing more for the work of God in a more effective way. Some churches are driven by fellowship. The church just becomes a big social club, a party atmosphere. We're not a social club. We are the church of Jesus Christ, and we have a different purpose than that of just social purposes. Some churches are driven by programs. I'm not against programs, but don't put your trust in a program. Don't treat the church like it's a system, like it's a computer. You just put it in and it spits out whatever needs to be spit out. The church isn't a system. It's a living organism of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our purpose is not to be driven by programs. Programs or buildings should not dictate what we put our time and energy into. We should always be asking ourselves, even though we're running a program, even though we need to fix up the building at times and do repairs and upgrades, we should always be asking ourselves, are we true to our purpose? It's a very, now we're not in that situation anymore, but it's a very dangerous time for a church when they get a building, when they transition, whether they're going to build a building or whether they're going to buy a building. It's so easy to become swallowed up, and I felt it, and become engrossed in the building that you choke the church and that you leave your purpose. Don't let anything stop you from the purpose of Cornerstone Baptist Church, as is ordained by God, that ye be witnesses unto him. And so if we're going to have a business meeting tonight to determine if we're going to do the work of God, that's a problem. No, we're not going to talk about it. We're going to get out there and do it, and we're going to knock on doors, and we're going to show people that there's a church in Chicago that cares about their soul. Churches all over America, with their money, with their building, with all of their programs, are satisfied with their eight people, and they're comfortable, and they're content, and never trying to reach new ground. They can be as sincere as the day is long, but that's not being a good Christian. Being a good Christian is to know your purpose. And my purpose is to be a witness. A witness. Who'd you witness to last week? Come on now. Well, I was in church when the doors were open. That wasn't the question. Who did you witness to last week? I read my Bible every day. I did my verse journal. That wasn't the question. Who did you witness to? We must understand our purpose. Secondly, we must understand our power source. Our power source. Look at Acts chapter 2 in your Bibles. Your King James Bibles. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse number 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. The church was together. Verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Man, they were filled. Now skip down to verse 32. Verse 32, the Bible says in verse number 32, this Jesus hath God raised up, 
whereof we all are witnesses. What happened when they got that power in the first verses we read? They became what? Witnesses. Do you want to know if you've got the power of God in your life? You're a witness. Verse 33, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Man, that's some heavy witnessing. They're witnessing. You know why? Because they're filled with power. You know what will happen when you get filled with power? Boom. You'll witness. You'll witness. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Man, their, their witnessing was effective. Verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. He kept on preaching. He kept on witnessing. Why? The power of God was upon them. And so they were witnesses. It was more than their paycheck. It was more than, who am I going to marry? It was more than, oh, I got to pay this bill. I got to meet this deadline. It was more than, I've got to do this. I've got to mow the grass. It was more than these things. They were filled with power and they were witnesses. Look at the result, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. The disciples and followers of Jesus went to the upper room where the Holy Spirit came. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. Then 120 people gave witness. They bore witness to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed it enough to speak to others. Oh, oh, don't miss what I just said. They believed it enough to speak to others. How could we really say we believe in hell, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? If we really believe those things, nothing could keep our mouths closed. When the followers of Jesus were filled with the Holy Spirit, they didn't stay huddled. If we were to go to a, the police station tonight where they do a roll call, what's the purpose of the roll call? To make sure that everybody is there. What's the purpose of the roll call? To lay out the mission for the evening, to let them know if there's any areas where there's been a spike in crime. They have the roll call so that they can get out and do the business. Listen, we have a roll call called Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We have a roll call where we come together so that the whole rest of the week we can get out and do the business. We need to break the huddle. In football, they come together and huddle. And if they huddle too long, listen, whistles are going to start blowing. You're wasting time. You're, you're going to get, I don't know what kind of penalty because you're not ready to play. Somebody in our church has to break the huddle. And let's get out there and do the work. That's what these 120 did. They broke the huddle. And they gave strong testimony about Jesus Christ. And the result, what was the result? 3,000 people got saved because some Christians got empowered, burdened, and they didn't let their affairs of life give them lock jaw. Understand our purpose. Understand our power source, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Third, 
understand our message. We need to understand our message. Look at chapter 3, if you would, verse number 1. Understand our message. The Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked in alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now notice, Peter and John did not major on a social gospel. The man was lame from his mother's womb. But Peter and John did not focus on the social gospel. They focused on the real gospel. They preached Jesus Christ. And then, and only then, did they help this man physically. In the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. And he took him by the hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entering with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. Man, they wanted to see what was going on. And when Peter saw it, he answered the peop unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? Here's this man standing up, leaping, praising God. The people see it. They recognize him, okay? He's there all the time. And the people start running and saying, what on earth just happened? And Peter could have taken the credit. But he didn't. He said, why are you looking at us like we did this? Our own power. Look at verse 13. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son, Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But he denied the holy and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. Man, that's hot preaching right there. He is laying it on thick and killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Who did you do that to last week? You say, I was too busy. I'm concerned about this and that. L listen, if you... If you are where you were a year ago spiritually, if you are where you are right now, where you were a year ago, you're backslidden. Because you're not trying to take new ground. Who were you a witness to this past week? Verse 16. And his name through faith in his name has made this man strong whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I want that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before hath showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The Holy Spirit empowered these people. And they couldn't keep their mouths shut. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. We should pray every day before we leave our houses. God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. They had one message and it was clear. Jesus Christ and him crucified. So you got to repent. Repentance was a big part of that message. 
that your sins may be blotted out. They didn't let the other issues sidetrack them. They didn't let Biden and Trump sidetrack them. They didn't let the migrants sidetrack them. They stayed right on message. Cornerstone Baptist Church, this week coming up, make sure you stay right on message and that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. The purpose, the power, the message, and then fourth, understanding accountability. Accountability, go to Acts chapter 5. We're kind of taking a, a travel through the book of Acts. Not the whole thing, don't worry. But Acts chapter 5. Here the evangelism or the soul winning was disrupted. Why? Because sin crept into the church. And the church is going along. Man, people are getting saved, getting saved, getting saved, getting saved. Acts 1, Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 4. Man, they've got it going on. Then Ananias and Sapphira, Acts 5. Look at Acts chapter 5, verse number 1. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And to keep back part of the price of the land. Look this way. They went, look this way. They went from being filled with the Holy Ghost to some of them lying to the Holy Ghost. And the souls stopped getting saved. Verse number four. I, I, I say that to say this. Tell the truth. You say, I'm going to look bad. Tell the truth. You say, I'm going to hurt behind it. You might. Tell the truth. Better for you to hurt than the heart of God to hurt. Verse number four. While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power and thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Now, now wait a minute. Peter asked the question. Peter asked a question, but it says here that they lied to God. Be careful. Verse number five, and Ananias hearing these words fell down and gave up the ghosts. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife not knowing what was done, came in. Now imagine her, here comes Sapphira, just bouncing in, coming to the church service. You know, just, you know, just sold some land, pocketed some of the money, threw some in the offering plate. You look good because you, you got them thinking that you gave it all, okay? Verse number eight, and Peter answered unto her, tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. I hope someone in our church membership doesn't have to drop dead for us to be filled with fear at what sin can do. Sin hurts our soul winning efforts. Hypocrisy. You're calling some other Christian a phony when all the time you're a phony. Gossiping, seeing others through your own eyes, fault finding whining, complaining, gossiping, not really praying, fleshly, filled with your own feelings. What does it take for real revival to take place in, in a church? It takes Christians who aren't going to be frauds about their faith. We can't have Ananias and Sapphira and think that we're going to win souls for Jesus Christ in Chicago. These people want to appear faithful without really having a warm walk with God. This happens in every church. 
One key is accountability. The church can't take a light view of sin with its members. We learned that from Ananias and Sapphira. There can't be gross sin going on in the church and then the leadership just close his eyes and pretend that it's not there. No, no, Peter did some digging, didn't he? Amen! Amen! When we talk to people outside the walls of our church, we better make sure we have clean lives. When we move into a community, we're supposed to be salt and light. Let's not be dark. <laughs> we're basically a selfish generation that cares about no one but ourselves. We're looking for the wrong things many times. We go through this life seeking out the wrong things and not seeking out God's things. And God cannot bless it. It takes cleansing on the inside. We need the accountability of the local church. So sometimes your preacher might have to pull you in and say, you were wrong right here. I'm going to have the Bible. It's going to be right here, chapter and verse. But you were wrong right here. People don't like to hear that they're wrong. But sin can't be ignored in the local church if we're going to win souls for Jesus Christ. And then, fifth, understanding how to organize. Understanding how to organize or to plan. We've got to organize and plan for lost souls. We must organize to grow. Go to Acts chapter 6. The sixth chapter of Acts is a description of the deacon ministry. The deacon ministry. Acts chapter 6, verse number 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied... There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business." But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. The disciples could no longer care for the congregation because it had gotten too big. And additional people were needed to assume some of the responsibilities if the church was going to flourish. The apostles couldn't do it all. The size of the church makes no difference. Anytime a church wants to move from where it is to where it wants to be, then there needs to be a spreading out of the responsibilities to people who are capable and willing. If this doesn't happen, you, you can't care for other people that are added to the body. Right. Not properly. This is why we split the bus routes. This is why I want to know what's going on on the bus routes, and I communicate with the captains to see how things are going. Pressure, good pressure. Even if the devil puts pressure on you to look at pornography, I'm going to put pressure on you to win souls. What's wrong with that? To build a route for the Lord. To give your Saturdays to the Lord. That's what the bus ministry is all about. A lot of it is giving your Saturdays to the Lord. Let me give you an example from Acts chapter 6, the passage we just read. One Monday morning, a widow called the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem, and James, the senior pastor, answered the telephone. James answered and said, yes, ma'am, how can I help you? She said, well, my chariot won't start. And James said, no problem, ma'am, I've got some jumper cables. I'll be over there right away. I just bought these jumper cables at Walmart. I'll be there and start your chariot. 
So James jumped into his chariot and went over to that church member's house, the widow, and cranked up the chariot with the jumper cables. No problem. Well, when he was gone, it all seemed to crash down upon the church. Every widow in the church had her chariot break down and called the church. None of the widows could start their chariots. And all of the apostles were out starting the chariots. They had to help the church members. This happened Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And Saturday morning, when they, when they all got back together, the apostles, that is, the 11, Judas wasn't a part of that group. When they all got together, they said, we've got to do something about this problem. These widows, we can't keep this up. So Peter said, why don't we just go to AutoZone? I heard that they've got a sale on batteries. So they went to AutoZone. They loaded up on batteries. And they took those batteries to all of the widows. And on Sunday morning, all of the widows were able to crank up their chariots and make it to church on time because they had their battery taken care of with no problem. During the choir and the special music, James started looking for his sermon notes and he couldn't find them. He realized he didn't have a sermon because he was out starting chariots all week long. He spoke to Peter, poked him with the elbow. He said, Peter, do you have a sermon? Peter didn't have a, not even Peter, the big mouth fisherman, not even did he have a sermon. James asked all of the apostles and not one had a sermon. So James told the congregation that he didn't have a sermon because he had out all week fixing chariots, trying to get them to start week in and week out. Church members expect their pastor to go out and start all of the chariots to make sure that every little single detail in the church building is correct and right. And listen to me, it is impossible for the pastor to visit everyone and to help with everything. That's why the ministry of the deacons was established. They're servants. Servants. What the church needs more of are servants who just want to see that all the widows make it to the, to the church service. The disciples added help so the church could be more flexible and grow. Next, understanding sacrifice. Go to Acts chapter 7. Understanding sacrifice. If we're going to have a revival in soul winning, you've got to understand sacrifice. Acts chapter 7, in verse number 51, we read of the stoning of Stephen. No one in any church has been asked to suffer this like Stephen did. Acts chapter 7, verse number 51, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him, that is Stephen, with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, that's why we don't witness like we should. And that's why we don't suffer the persecution that comes when you do. He was filled with the Holy Ghost and it made him witness. I think we're just sending the the, the true message that we're not full of the Holy Ghost. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. 
And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen, the first deacon, died for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He didn't get a trophy. He didn't get a plaque. He got stoned. He sacrificed his life. And we can't sacrifice our Saturday mornings. Stephen sacrificed his life. And we can't pass out a gospel tract to the cashier at the store. Stephen gave his life, and we can't learn the plan of salvation. We call ourselves Christians? Come on, Christian, where's our sacrifice? Man, to us, if the pastor preaches a little bit long, what a sacrifice. Tell that to Stephen when you meet him someday. How big of a sacrifice that longer service was. For the first time in 2,000 years, we have a generation of Christians without a religious backbone that really don't understand what it means to give the full measure of their life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We also have a generation that is not hearing the gospel outside of the church building. That's why we street preach. Two locations yesterday. That's why, because we have a generation that's not hearing the gospel out there. Many are preaching it in here, but not out there. Break the huddle, Christian. Have a revival and soul winning. We must function outside of the four walls of this building. And so, I want to offer to you tonight that there are two types of churches. One is the church where the pastor is a hired employee. And he is paid a salary to go and do all of the church work. In this church, nothing is asked of the people except that they come warm a pew, and put some money in the offering plate. The other type of church is one where the pastor is an equipper of the saints. He prepares the saints to go out and do the work of God. Not that he doesn't go, he ought to go, but his primary job is to prepare and equip and perfect the saints for the work of the ministry. We all have spiritual gifts. Not everyone's going to serve in the same way, but the equipping pastor helps the people be what they're supposed to be and be plugged in where they're supposed to be. This type of pastor is a soul winner, but he's an equipper. An equipper. The equipping pastor will prepare the saved to lead other people to Jesus Christ. And that's how the church can go forward. When all the saved go out and share Christ, not just the pastor, when all of the saved go out and share Jesus Christ, we must visit people. And you need to start writing stuff down and following back up and not just saying, oh, maybe we'll come back someday. No, go back. You told them you would. Don't be a liar. 10,000 doors. 10,000 doors by December 31st. When we come to church on Sunday morning, we should celebrate as the body of Christ. We should celebrate what the Lord has been doing all week through our ministry. Not just slide in because we're supposed to be here, but come celebrating how God used us on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And Sunday morning on your way to church if you stop somewhere. Your church doesn't call its members to serve. The people won't get saved and they won't grow. And that's why I have always taken the approach, I believe in the approach, I see it in the New Testament, that you get the people busy. You get them serving God. You get them doing something for the Lord. It'll, it'll take away some of the time for the gossiping and all of that if they're busy doing something for Jesus Christ. That's what I believe. And, and a lot of churches are stuck and go no further because the pastor is afraid to ask something of his people. And so because nothing's asked of them, they do nothing. And the church is nothing. Are you hearing me? And so we have to look at where we are as a church and ask ourselves, are we really making the difference we're supposed to make in Woodlawn, in Hyde Park, on your bus route? God sees our churches today, I'm afraid, moving back and forth like an old oscillating fan, not knowing what position it's supposed to be in. Here a little bit, there a little bit. 
We can't decide if we're going to put our lives on the line for God. I don't want him to look at Cornerstone and say, you're lukewarm. I wish you were cold or hot, like he told the church in Revelation. But because you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Which will you be, hot or cold? You're either a soul winner or a backslider. Where are you at tonight? We need a revival of soul winning. We have the book of Acts. We have the scriptures. We have the Holy Spirit. But does the Holy Spirit have us? Witnesses witnesses care more about the loss than your next cheeseburger you hear me father i pray that you fill some in this room with the holy spirit and that we'll open our mouths for christ help us lord to be witnesses i pray this in jesus name amen